So it's six three from my time and you're welcome to today's episode of The Lawyer's Diary. I mean, The Lawyer's Diary, for over 10 weeks now, we've been producing weekly legal updates from the areas of family law, company law, commercial law, criminal law, among other things. And today, I'm privileged to have one of my very own seniors, one of my lecturers, and um, a brother to join us to have discussions in the areas of insurance law. So our topic for today is insurance claims, knowing the nuances. And we have in our midst today, lawyer Edmond Nelson Amasa. Lawyer Amasa is a lecturer at the Faculty of Law who lectures insurance law, commercial law, sometimes through agribusiness law and ethics. He currently practices with Obin Ben Law Firm in Kumasi. He serves as the executive chairman of the Chamber of Banking and Insurance Consumers. And he's a graduate from the Cambridge University. So, Laya Masa, welcome to today's episode of The Lawyer's Diary. Thank you, thank you, my brother. Thank you. And then we also have in our midst a practice, uh, practicing insurance person in the person of Mr. Daniel Tando. Mr. Daniel Tando is an RM for Special Markets for Enterprise Insurance. Mr. Tando, welcome to today's episode of Lawyers Diary as well. All right, thank you. It's my pleasure. All right, so um, let's zoom straight into action. And it's 6-5, so we are zooming straight into action now. Ms. Amasa, when we say insurance. Can you give us a brief summary of what the concept of insurance is? What is insurance? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I will, I will say that uh, I always start my lectures on insurance with a popular Christian theme. And uh, that name is so dear to my heart because of uh, its relation and of insurance. And we say that blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. So the, the whole concept of insurance is also optimized by that him that blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. So if you say blessed assurance, and you know that assurance means that there's a kind of hope that someone is assuring you that look, don't worry, whatever will happen to you, I'm there for you. Uh, so if the Christian say that blessed assurance means that that assurance that you're given is so blessed that it will definitely be fulfilled. And if you relate it to insurance, you realize that it's all about risk. This life, the Christians believe that life is full of risk and there's a need for you to have a perspective of what, where you go after here. Now, you don't know what will happen. In the future, should you do that. So, the reason is that if the prophet Jesus Christ confess and follow him and he die, that assurance that we give to them will put them in the better perspective of the unknown. So, when you relate that one to insurance, we can see that insurance is just about the unknown. You are faced with uncertainty, you are faced with risk, and you don't know what to do, you don't know how to manage the risk. You don't know what will happen if the risk to okay, what fit uh, lies ahead of you. So you are saying that, okay, I'm too small, or for one reason or that, I cannot manage my risk. Let me get someone who is bigger enough to manage that risk for me, so that should the risk materialize, that person will give me a place or put me back in the position that I was before the risk okay or will make my life so better if so desire for me. So the, the, the whole concept of insurance is about risk management. Insurance is about risk management. So if you are affecting insurance, you are saying that you want the risk to be managed by an entity or somebody who is specialized or who has 
you know how to manage the risk as compared to yourself. So basically, that is assurance, risk management. Okay. All right, so oh. um, if insurance is purely about risk management, in terms of the benefits, can we then say that uh, you can't overreach yourself with insurance, but just to put yourself in the position in which you were before any incidents occurred? Is that the whole concept about insurance? Or there can be an instance where probably because of the insurance you get, um, your position will change in a way? Yeah, well, well that, that brings us to under perspective of insurance, you know, we have different types of insurance and different purposes for insurance. You have the indemnity insurance, which means basically that you'll be indemnified per your actual loss. So if uh, I have thousand cities in my pocket, the risk I face is that the thousand cities must get stolen, must get lost, must get damaged, must, be, must get washed by the flood or other things. And the risk that I face is actually that should this of any peril happen, I cannot get my thousand cities in my pocket. So therefore, why don't I contact someone to give the risk of me losing my thousand and cities too? And look, let's enter into this uh, contract in case any you of know, this unforeseen event happens and I lose my thousand cities, then you will give me my thousand cities back. So indemnity insurance is just about putting you back to the position that you were at a time or before your loss, at the time of your loss. So that's a difference. And that indemnity insurance is not meant to really profit you. you know, the essence of it is just to make sure that you are placed at the position that you were before the loss, okay, which is your actual loss. And I have to say that, in fact, insurance, so to speak, is not to benefit you. You don't go to insurance because you want to reap benefit. It's, it's, it's not saving. See, it's, 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 not, it's not basically uh, investment. That I'm investing and I'm going to get profit on that investment. It, it's just like, I relate it to like you attending church service and you paying your offering and tithes and everything. The essence of paying it is to make sure that your, your well-being is catered for you also fulfilling certain values that in case you want to stop the church, you cannot go and say that, please give me all my offering and tithes plus interest on it. So we we mm -hmm. it's not about profit making. Yes. Okay, okay. So uh, Mr. Tambo, aside the fact that um, the insurance is to put you in a position in which you were before any incident occurred, are there any other reasons why why people should even think about having insurance in the first place? I like the premise with the lawyer um, Edmund started that. Um, I know in this country, majority of us are Christians. And normally when you approach people to sell insurance to, what they normally tell you is that uh, Jesus is my insurer. Yes, of course, Jesus is our, our, our ultimate uh, insurer. But in as much as we are um, seeking for spiritual assurance, we also have to look for physical assurance. And as uh, lawyer Edmond said, it's just a transfer of uh, risk. Mr. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but your camera is off. What happened? Okay, let me just turn on my yeah. camera. Why should Tarika Kakasa? Um, Mara Poku, can you please um, mute yourself? Come on, the other time you keep on our side. I'm going to get you with you. I where I now Hello. 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 Can you please, uh, mute your microphone. Mara, can you please mute your microphone? I can't seem to do it from here. Go ahead. Okay, so as I was saying, it's an arrangement by which a company or a yeah, state and I take to provide a guarantee of compensation. Well, for sure, specified okay. illness or death in return for payment of a specified premium. A so insurance is basically the transfer of risk to an insurance company or the states. You know, majority of our state uh, vehicles are not insured because the state itself has insured uh, the vehicles in a way.
Hello. Uh, Mr. Tondo, we can hear you. Go yeah. ahead. So one of the main reasons why one have to um, go in for an insurance is, you know, when it comes to life, there are so many uncertainties. And some of the uncertainties that happens to us can have a devastating effect on our entire life. So there is the more that is the more reason why we have to insure ourselves and our, our properties so as to um, have a peace of mind. It's just having a peace of mind. Should in case those events should happen to us, then we are not at a total loss, but rather we are being compensated by the insurance company or the state. Okay, so in terms of the various insurances that we have, can you give us a summary of it? What are the types of insurance that currently we have in the country? All right, so we have what we call the life insurance and the general insurance. So. Life insurance basically means that you're insuring your life against an unforeseen risk. But that event, that event will surely happen to us. So when you take a typical funeral policy, you know with funeral policy, we are insuring against death. And death will eventually happen to us. But as and when that event will happen to us, we cannot determine. So that is the more reason why we have to ensure against those that or any um, peril that will be befall on us. Because if those events happen, then it means that we have to fall on our savings or sell a property in order to arrange for a befitting uh, barrier for our lab who has passed on. And also when it comes to general business, with the general business, what we do is that we ensure the property based on the value that you place on that property. So for example, if you buy a car today, you place a value on that car. So I bought a Mercedes Benz worth 50,000 Ghana CD. If I go to an insurance company, I'm going to insure the car for 50,000 Ghana CD. And you know insurance, you are not supposed to make profit on it. Rather is to put you on the same level before uh, prior to the event happening. So it's just to put you on the same level as we were before the event. But when it comes to life insurance, with life insurance, you can insure yourself in multiple insurance companies and have multiple benefits because you cannot place value on life. When it comes to life, I don't think no one can tell me I'm worth a million dollars or I'm worth $2 million. No, you mm -hmm. cannot place value on life. That is a more reason why when it comes to life insurance, you can insure yourself multiple times. But when it comes to general business, you cannot ensure that property in multiple insurance company. Okay, okay, thanks for the insight. Mr. Ansar, is there anything that you want to yeah, I just, to I just the, want the various to, types of insurance? Yeah, that, that, so you, you see clearly that we have the indemnity insurance and the uh, contingent insurance. So the okay. actually, right, it's an indemnity insurance goes with your actual loss, which has to replace you at your position that you were before the loss occurred. And the life insurance, as you rightly say, you cannot put a value on your life, not even your finger. Uh, only the way your competition. No, but in, in, in terms of putting value in life, I am of the opinion that sometimes you look at your assets of a person, then you can place a proposed premium on it. Um, a person who is worth, say, the net worth is around $500 million. Persons like Christian Ronaldo, persons like Lionel Messi. I mean, in as much as we may not be able to put some kind of figures on their lives, I, I mean, there, there should be some pegging in terms of finances on them. I don't know whether I'm right. That's against maybe an ordinary uh, a person of um, a person of straw. Yeah, lawyer say. In my position, right? I'm, sorry. I'm glad you said a proposed value. Yes. I'm glad you said proposed value, but it's not the actual value of the person because yeah. we are just assuming that that person is worth this X amount. Mm. And, and and my, my, confusion, my confusion was that when you said we can't place value on human life, but uh, we may be able to place some proposed values based on yes, the proposed value. Yes, yeah, proposed yeah. value. But that value can be um, 
contended by a lot of people. You can tell me I'm worth a million dollars, but others can say no. This is worth less or more the value you've placed on me. Recently, one of the actors was said to be worth over $200,000. And he said, me, $200,000. I've never seen that money before. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and you see, but honestly, if, if we ask you, uh, what's the value of your life? How much will you say yourself for? Um, so, okay, for, 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 uh -huh. for now, I mean, I can't place value on it. <laughs> Yeah, you can't face, but on a life itself, maybe. So, 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 you see clearly that we are not looking at the material things that the person has or is made up of. We are looking at life as the person has everybody has life. We cannot place any value on that life because everybody's life is valueless. Okay, and that has been one of the contention. If you look at the section four of the insurance act, where you see that insurance contract must not be limitless. The must be a sense of coming out with a formula to put a limit on how much a person should claim. Okay. And it can be very problematic because it's difficult for you to quantify one's life. And, and if you go by that tangent, you, you have a huge problem. Because who is going to tell the value of the person's life? When I'm expecting insurance with you, and you ask me how much I'm worth. I say, well, for now, I'm worth 50,000. Then tomorrow I wake up and realize that even the tradition which is higher than what I had. So my life is now worth okay. 50,000. I have to come and tell you that my life is now 50,000. The next day, yeah, my life we'll is now we'll 50,000. We'll come to that aspect where I do an insurance and there's a change in circumstance. But before we go there, let's talk about the formalities of our insurance. I want to undertake insurance. Ms. Amaza, legally, what are the practical steps that I need to do? And then in terms of um, the content of my insurance contract with an insurance company, what should go into it? Okay, so, okay. so um, let me realize that insurance is a special form of contract. It doesn't follow the normal general contract uh, uh, doctrine or rules. In fact, we have offer acceptance and consideration, which is paramount. Um, but aside that, insurance also deals with what we call insurable interest. For you to insure a subject matter, you have to demonstrate that you have a pecuniary relationship with that subject matter. And you need to understand that if that subject matter is destroyed, it will put some financial burden on you. So that, that that will be your attachment to the subject matter. The belief is that if you have a down relationship with that subject matter, you will not destroy that subject matter because of the special relationship you have with that subject matter. If I want to ensure my life, it's accepted because my life is my life. I own my life. I can ensure it. I can ensure the life of my wife because the life is my life, the two shall be one. I can ensure a life. But of course, you cannot ensure the life of your friend, your girlfriend, your mistress, and your houseboy. You cannot ensure that unless once you show them a certain category of employment. But you have to demonstrate that look, if this one should pass away today, or this property should be burned today, I suffered to lose something, the risk that I face in being homeless, the risk that I face. And the flood was now away my car and asking, it's what I'm going to ensure. So if you cannot demonstrate that look, have this financial burden I'm going to suffer should the salary matter be destroyed, then you have to think about it. You cannot go into that insurance because you can go ahead, you pay your premium, but I'm telling you the insurance company will deny your claim when you put in. Another aspect that you have to also look at is the duty of uh, ultimate good faith, which means that there's a, a duty in Ghana. In Ghana, we assured as a duty not to conceal any information to the insurance company. So all the information that the insurance company will ask, do you drink, do you smoke, do you go jogging, do you wash, do you do this? If it's yes, you have to give them a yes answer. If you try to conceal the information, that would be, uh, be construed to mean that you are trying to hide something from the insurance company. In fact, on, 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 the, on the full disclosure, on the full disclosure, um, does full disclosure not also amount to, uh, or not, or that also not results in um, increased premium? Because imagine yeah, I'm coming for life insurance. Uh, yes, coming for life insurance, and you tell me that do I drink, do I smoke? If I say yes, yes, it means that there, but there is a likelihood of me dying, and that will affect the premium that I have to pay. 
Yes. So when it comes to life insurance, we call something an item. Yeah, Mr. Tando, you can go ahead. Yes. We call something underwriting. Underwriting simply means that you assessing the risk that you are taking to give a corresponding premium to. So if you come to an insurance company that you want to insure yourself for an X amount, what the underwriter will do is to take your medical reports and see whether you are at risk or you are at, um, whether you are high or low risk. When you're at high risk, it means that you have to load the premium. So your premium might go up. Just suppose that with someone who doesn't drink or smoke. Mm. And, and, and to continue with that, you know that we, we, we already established the fact that insurance is about risk management, okay? Yeah. So therefore, the insurance companies are also there to maximize efficiency and minimize cost. So if exactly. they, they don't do those assessments and they say, okay, they don't do your medical records, you doing so you have to the insurance, they are going to lose because within one week, you, you might die. And you put your defenders to put in a case <laughs> or you might suffer a serious uh, injury and you put in a case. So that is one key area that insurance companies are very careful with that. The, the disclosure is well done. But it's another, it's another uh, uh, subject area which we cannot even a uh, touch on it today because uh, UK has to move away from the common law principle, which Ghana we are still holding on to because we are abandoning our static position. So we can we can have an update for disclosure. What would be it? It's a fantastic area, but Ghana we have a lot of challenges around it. Okay. So the, the the of, at, yeah. On the aspect of utmost good faith and full disclosure, um, there was an instance where a woman was insuring her jewelry. And then on the forms, after answering everything, the insurance form asked, do you have any other thing you want to disclose? Her husband was an ex-convict and she failed to disclose that. To her, it wasn't really an information which was worth sharing. Now, things break into the premises. And the insurance company is like, if you had disclosed that your husband was an ex-convict, even though it wasn't a specific question, to them, that might have influenced the premium and also um, uh, made them in terms of management of the risk. So the yeah. question is that, I mean, um, is the woman justified for not disclosing that the husband was an ex-convict? Because the, it wasn't an specific answer, but just a general a question that was asked. Yeah, you, are, you, are, you are making reference to yes. you are making reference to the Lambert case. Yes, yes. Lambert, that's cooperative insurance. You see, and that, that that used to be the position of the common law that an insured has a duty to disclose every material fact voluntarily. That is that you have moved, has moved away from that position. So right now, you are not under any obligation to volunteer any information. The, 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 especially that if the insurance company needs any answers, they need to ask questions. If no questions are asked, no answers given. That is the essence of the proposal form. The proposal form has been standardized to say that certain questions are mandatory for the insurance company to get answers to, to decide whether they will go ahead with the insurance uh, uh, cover or which premium they are going to take. So that position of Lambert has now been eroded by statute. With Ghana, we have long time that statute, but of course, we, 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 don't, we don't apply it because the statute has put it under consequential amendment in relation to national health insurance. So when it comes to general insurance, we are trying to follow the common law, which is Lambert, which has been eroded in the end. It's in 2012, Consumer Disclosure of the Patient Act, and even the Insurance Contract Act of 2015 has done away with Lambert. But Ghana, we are holding up to the common, common law, and that's a, a great concern for us because this of disclosure is very, very important. Because for me, disclosure is the basis of uh, the, 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 the calculation of the premium. So without full disclosure, exactly. there can't be um, a correct premium exactly. which is covering the exactly. insurance in the first place. So if yeah, we so, do uh, Mr. 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 Tando, we can go ahead. Yeah, so 
whether or not the woman disclosed whether the husband is an ex-convict will not influence the premium. However, it will give a material fact to the insurer that this is the risk that they are being exposed to, that the husband was once upon a time a convict of this crime, but that will not influence the premium of the woman. But, but the, because the, he no, has no, it, that, no, no, sorry to cut you. Uh, yeah. The, the essence of disclosure is yeah. true. It informs the insurance company or the prudent insurer as to whether I should take up the risk or not. Exactly. That's the first thing. Exactly. And, and secondly, if, if they will take up the risk, is to determine the premium they are going to charge. Because sometimes a client can bring a case to you that you see that this case, you don't want to do it. Because when you look at the case, it's a bad case. And if you don't want to tell the client to feel bad that it's a bad case, some people will go and charge a, a legal fee that you know is impossible for the client to pay. It's a matter of telling the client that this case is bad. But the insurance company, when they say, look, I drink, I smoke, smoke, I do this, and say that the risk is high. And they want to increase the premium financial so insurance, you ask, what should I pay for the amount for the uh, premium okay. for this insurance? And you go away. So the nature of the uh, is very... Yeah, yeah lawyer Masa. Yeah. Lawyer Masa, theoretically, yeah, you cannot, yeah. yeah, theoretically, you cannot charge a premium based on whether or not the husband was an ex convict. But practically, it gives the insurer some kind of uh, some kind of uh, risk that they are taking on board. So, practically, although they will load the premium, yeah. but they will not tell you this is the reason why yeah. Yeah. the exactly. premium. Exactly. Because it will be no, no. That, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, you, you, you see, the, the essence that we've established is that insurance is about risk management. Exactly. Insurance companies want to make money. To be, to be in, if they want to be in business, they have to make sure that the people co co materialize. Well, if you are running so they will make sure that they don't go out of business by minimizing costs. And that's one of the essence of the concept of risk management. And so therefore, they take into consideration hazards. So we have moral hazards, we have moral, and we have physical hazards. And in fact, exactly. dishonesty, integrity, and other things are, are areas that the companies use to manage uh, what if they are telling me I look my wife is first convict of robbery and other things. Yes. Yes. So uh, you mentioned two types of hazards. Three, three types. You mentioned three two types. types of hazards. Can you three. can you explain it for us? Two types of hazards, moral hazard and something. What what what's the difference? We have, we have, we have moral moral hazard, which has to do with dishonesty, integrity, and all the rest. That, uh, so that if you look at that sword, and that sword is a person of dis, dishonest, it's a dishonest person, it lacks integrity. Then you don't believe that sword in the first place because the person who lacks uh, integrity can, can, can do anything to the subject matter and come and put in a problem clay. So it's, it's, it's an area that wants to be said that this person is lying. You won't go in. And that was the, uh, the aspect of uh, uh, Lambert's case. We have the fiscal as a this with the fiscal composition of the subject matter, the location, the make. So when you're insuring a car, you ask which year was the car made, what purpose are you going to use the car for? Well, commercial vehicles cannot pay the same premium as compared to private vehicles. The same way, if the person is, is a professional person, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he is somebody who is very careful, it also goes to affect the, the, the risk. Because if you look at morale, morale which has to do with carelessness. The person is careless, yeah. the person does not care, don't drink and drive, the person drink and drive, the person gets accidents all the time. So, so if you are insuring a person, how many times have you? Put in a claim. How many times have you been involved in an accident? And the person says that, oh, last, uh, just last week I was involved in an accident, last two months, three accidents. You have to know that hey, this is high risk. So yeah. if you go ahead and insure the person, the person will pay only small premium, but you are going to pay billions of uh, uh, compensation. So, so, so this disclosure goes with Bora and, and, and Bora and Pisca and that, which helps the insurance company to maximize the efficiency by uh, uh, trying to manage the risk that has been given to them by that short. It's a great area that insurance companies don't do.
Yeah, so to add to what uh, lawyer Masa said, so normally when you go out to take a survey of um, an insured property, so for example, if you go out to examine a building, what we look out for is some of the fiscal hazard that the lawyer Masa uh, spoke about. We look at how they keep the, 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 the way they keep the place itself. So for example, if you go to a factory, you look at how they keep their oil, their liquids, their, their uh, dusters, everything. All this thing gives you a sense of uh, the fiscal hazard that you have been exposed to. And all these things also influence in, in the build up of the premium. Exactly. Exactly. Perfect. Because, I don't know, you cannot compare how that is being insured in this legal to how that is being insured in Cocoa Pay. Exactly. <laughs> because they, 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 when the person is insured in the house in Cocoa Pay against fire, then you know that no, the person will not even pay the first premium. When the person is even signed the contract, they will be fired there. Will be fired there. Yeah, no, so, so, no, no, the, no, no, no. the location is very, very important to insurance. insurance. So for for example, important. when you look at um, a place like a uh, North Industrial Area, it's a flat prone area. So when an insurer is going there to take a survey of the place, you know that that place is a flat prone area. So definitely there's going to be a lot of claims coming up from that place. So it's yeah, either they reject the risk or they load the, 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 the premium. You know. Okay. okay. Either you reject the risk or you load yeah. the premium. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, Mr. Masa, aside the disclosure and then the um, other one that you talked about, for the formation of insurance contract, is there, is there any other thing that we have to look out for? Oh, yeah, I, I think the most important thing that I always keep on saying uh, is the proposal form. The proposal form. You see, my main concern has been that when the proposal form is given to a prospective insured, that, 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 that proposal form in the hands of the prospective insured is it's an offer that the, the, the prospective insured is going to make or is making. The proposal form itself is just an invitation to treat. The insurance company is inviting you. That we have a life in and this is proposal for freely. The details that you are going to put in is the offer you are making to the insurance company. For the insurance company to accept by signing the carefully. Because one of the proposal forms that I have says that we will not cover any liability until we've done inspection of the building. Meaning that you have the policy in your hand. But that policy is not conclusive because the insurance company has not done due, due diligence. Sometimes, when it comes to life, you will say that look, you, the life cover uh, coverage will not start unless when I'm to pay the first premium. So you have a proposal, uh, you have a, a policy in your hands, but once you know it's set the premium, you are not covered. But if you put in that once I sign the product form and give it to the insurance company, then I'm done. But you have to, what is insurance? Is the policy or the certificate, not the proposal form. The policy. Make sure you have the policy and read because all the terms of the uh, contract are embedded in the policy. The proposal, and the insurance companies have a way to do the, the, the proposal form usually they write it in small, small letters that doesn't even encourage people to read. I don't know whether the insurance intentionally do that. No, no, no. no even, even, even that's what I'm going to uh, apologize to Daniel. That, without apology, you see, they will write the big things which are very juicy. And they'll write the, the, the things that will go up against you in a small ink. Oh, That's the yeah. KDR. KDR. So, so, so we lawyers are very careful about the KDR, the small print, not the big, to write the big signboard, everybody can read it. That this happens, mm -hmm. we may change, we may change your old boot with a new boot. I don't want to mention the company's name. We may change your old boot with a new boot. Insurance is about indemnity aspect, not life, indemnity. So if you have an old boot, why would the first company give you a new boot? That's on that terrorist <laughs> <laughs> But they ain't making You made a very good point in terms of the premium and payment. I know that um, according to like the, the insurance act, no premium, no payment, no, no, no coverage. So if you don't pay your premium, you're not covered. But practically, Mr. Tango, you are well aware that insur the insurance usually have some kind of internal arrangement with their clients where they make projected payment. So if I insure my car for 80,000 cities and then the premium is say 3,000, I can make arrangements or the insurance companies now allow that you pay 1,500 and then maybe in six months time, 
but I will give me the policy document. Oh yes, we have payment uh, settings for clients. We have payment settings for clients. And that one is uh, a different agreement between you and the insurance company. But what if something happens prior to me fully paying my insurance? They have to pay the claim. They have to pay your claim in full amount. Because okay. that's a separate agreement apart from the, the main contract that you are signing on. So with the payment schedule, it's based on your loyalty with the insurance company. That is why they gave you that payment schedule. So when they are due to that payment schedule and something happens within that uh, time frame, they are deemed to pay all your summer short in full. All right. All right. Let me chip in. Let me chip in. Let me chip in on that. Quickly. All right. Quickly, let me chip in on that quickly. You see, if you look at section 77 of the insurance act, which deals with premium, it's very clear that the insurance company can credit or the assurance can credit the premium for no more than 90 days. It's clear in the insurance act. However, in 2014, there was a policy directive, a guideline by the National Insurance Commission under the, under the uh, auspices of uh, Madam Lydia Bauer that no premium, no cover. But because that was just a policy directive and a guideline, the insurance companies are not going by it because the policy directive cannot override a, a statutory provision. Exactly. Exactly. The point. So the law says that I can I can credit premium for nine ninety days, three months. But the, the NIC is saying that no premium, no cover, and the insurance company are not going by it because it, it's just a policy directive. Like okay, so uh, lawyer master, the ninety day uh, credit facility is just there for it's like a grace period to the insured. That they should yes to be able to uh, have cover. And it has 90 days. So in fact, the has said that even after 90 days, the person is the person that's not paid. The insurance company can charge interest on it. It's not exactly. in our laws, but the National Commission are saying that no premium, no cover. <laughs> I think that uh, that directive was there just to um, deter people from not paying their premiums because you know oh, exactly. insurance companies do complain a lot that the clients don't pay their premiums, and when there's a claim, they rush into uh, I mean file the claims. So this was just a directive just to deter them. But that has that, been really the problem of the commission because everything is about guidelines and directives. Instead of them going to parliament and ally to give it a full backing of the law, they use guidelines which people don't go by. It. Anyway, we are here to talk about claims. So, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, um, to talk about in terms of um, the next phase that we want to go, how do I make a claim if I've already done my insurance contract with um, an insurance company and something happens? Practically, as a layman, when something happens, how do I file for a claim? What are the things that I need to do? Where do I go to? Mr. Tango, if you want to take that yeah, so like, like I said, you have to be more specific here. Is it when it comes to motor insurance or life insurance? Well, this one, let's take it one after the other. Let's okay. Because you are from life, let's take life insurance. Okay, so when it comes what to life... What are the practical steps that I have to take? So when it comes to life insurance, you just have to notify the insurer within uh, 90 days. So when you notify the insurer, you then fill the claim form. Hello, am I online? Yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah. So you then fill a claim form, then you attach evidence of the debt to the claim form. Then you submit together with your ID card, and that is uh, good to go. But when it comes to the general business, that is motor insurance, you need to submit a couple of documents, like the police reports, the pictures of uh, the damaged parts of the vehicle, you need to complete a claim form. You need to attach a driver's license to it. And that is it for a motor insurance, for you to be able to uh, process a motor insurance claim. Yeah. But when it comes to um, the motor insurance, there is a gray area. When you have your own vehicle that um, has been involved in an accident, 
let's say you are home, uh, you, you go home and I mean, you, 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 you crash your car in your wall. You don't need a police report to prove that you had an accident home. But when you have an accident with a third party where there's a bone of contention to who, who they fought it, that is where the police come in to write a police report to support your, your claim. Okay, I don't know what so, I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, to add to what Daniel has just said, uh, you realize that uh, we have components of insurance. We have the uh, first party insurance and we have a third party insurance. Okay, we also have the a comprehensive insurance and a third party insurance. So if your, your insurance is comprehensive, then it's it, 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 it comprehensive, it embodies a third party element of it. Yes. So therefore, when it comes to your personal first party insurance, if your motor vehicle has run into someone's own, you don't need any proof to show that your vehicle has damaged. But with a third party, you need a proof before the insurance company, when the insurance company also wants to establish liability before they pay. You want to establish the fact that you are liable because when they research your liability against the third party. So if you cannot prove with the police report that the police are coming to it, they mark everything and realize that you are culpable, you are you are the cop feeder, then the insurance company will not, not pay. But surprisingly, because of our situation in Ghana, the road is narrow, the payments are not there, chaos containers are for the, uh, the payment and everything. When there's accident, you see the, uh, the other motorists only ping, ping, move the car, move the car. Then, then this small thing, why, why are you blocking traffic? They will <laughs> move the cars from the accident scene. And yeah. when the car is moved from the accident scene, the police cannot come in and give you a report. Exactly. The police cannot give you a report because the car is moved from the accident scene. They cannot establish liability. And that is one of the biggest problems when it comes to putting up these claims and all these things. But from your, Mr. Rosa, from your last statement, if due to administrative error by, say, the police, which is not the fault of um, the insured or the assured. Why should an administrative, a governmental administrative uh, error affect payment of premium to, payment of claims to a person who has already paid your premium for? Let me say this. Uh, okay, okay. Let's not also not be oblivious of the fact that they are fraudulent claims. Therefore, okay. we need police report to ascertain the authenticity of the uh, uh, accident. Yes. However, when it comes to uh, third party property damage, we have a minimum limit to which we pay. That is about 5,000 Ghana CD. The maximum, that, maximum. Five, yeah, that, that is the minimum to us. However, the okay. insured can have a request for an upwards adjustment of that uh, um, uh, benefit to be up, uh, upgraded in a way. So the minimum that we pay that is, if you take a standard third-party uh, policy, the minimum that we pay for third-party uh, property damage is 5,000 Ghana CD. But it can be reviewed upon the request of the client to any amount of, uh, of choice of the, of the client. Yeah, I think for, for, for my text, uh, Daniel, all the policies I've seen in respect to motor uh, third-party insurance, as a maximum yeah. Uh, of of 2,000, physical damage. It, it has been reviewed. So the current position of the law is 5,000. Which is the maximum, maximum, yeah, yeah. not minimum. So a standard third party no policy, yeah. Maximum. So we, so we, we, don't do more than maximum, we don't use maximum here because the clients can, however, review the, the, the benefits. So the standard policy for third party is 5,000 Ghana CD. Property damage is 5,000 Ghana CD. But it can be reviewed upwards upon the request of the client to any amount of the, uh, the, the and, client service. And this, and this should be done at the time of doing the insurance, not when the accident has okay. already occurred. Yes, at the start of the policy. Okay, okay, okay. So in third party insurance claims, in yeah. third party yeah. insurance claim, yeah. Any payment so, is made to the third party whose vehicle has been affected and not to the person who's, who, who insured himself, right? Exactly. As the name suggests, third party. Mm. But there is no cap to as to when it comes to bodily injury or death to a uh, third party. Okay, so I mean, I mean this, that, this should be explained very well because for some people, they, they think that once they do the third party and something happens, 
they themselves will be covered under such kind of insurance? No, 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 no. Okay. So, even for, bodily, even for bodily injury. So for bodily injury and uh, death, there is no cap to it. It will also okay. determine by the court of competent no, jurisdiction. In terms of the person, the person who insured or who took the insurance, third party Good insurance job. doesn't cover the, the person. It's just for third party insurance, third parties. Yes, yeah, third parties. It's third parties. So but they can be Why then, be why then can would you want to do a third party insurance? That, that has been our because problem. That has been our problem because you know there's a misconception that uh, insurance people are thieves, and how, why should I go and give this a uh, lot of money to them to to insure my vehicle? So they, they don't see the reason why they have to take up an insurance policy. Therefore, they sought to just doing a third party because of uh, the laws governing our land. Because uh, if you have a car, it is uh, mandatory that you should have at least a third party insurance. So they choose the minimum. Exactly. Yeah. But, but, and with the but, third but, party, we also have the third party fire and theft. So the third party, uh, uh, the third party fire and theft is in addition to the cover provided by the third party. That is uh, the property damage of, uh, of five thousand plus if your car is being stolen, or any part uh, of or, or on, on your vehicle is being stolen, or there is fire on your vehicle, then the insurance company will come in to compensate you or to replace the stolen uh, parts of the vehicle. Okay, okay, okay. It's, it's kind of, I, I still don't really um, get the reason. Maybe it may be for financial reasons, but if I undertake an insurance and the insurance only covers third parties without me, who is a principal uh, person, having any benefit whatsoever, in terms of bodily injury, in terms of physical damage, then uh, I, I honestly don't see any reason for third party. Yeah, but, yeah, the, quickly on that, quickly on that, uh, quickly on that. You see, the, the, the essence is that we should not lose fact uh, that uh, third party is mandatory. So what I like to know, that Daniel said, you have to pay, you have to comply with. Now, if you look at the circumstances and, 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 and the agro, you have to go through for you to even put in a claim, for your claim to even be paid, when you pay a compressive premium, which sometimes can even raise from 5,000, 6,000 per, per year, and you, you drive your car, you drive your car, and that you are avoiding accidents, and that's not the third company. And the first company will put you through a whole lot of circumstances before they give you a compensation. It doesn't make insurance attractive. I'm saying that insurance companies and the regulators and artists are part of the reason why insurance is not attractive. Because if they are paying claims on time, people know that, oh yes, let me pay compensation because I know when my car gets damaged, I'm going to get the car. In other jurisdictions, if you have compensation insurance and you are involved in accident, they give you a taxi car, a car to use to solve the problem of either giving you a new car, or your standard from the car that got damaged, or your money. But here in Ghana, compensation that you pay for about five years, ten years, you still check the insurance companies for more than six months, send them to court because they don't want to pay. And that is why it's not attractive. So let me go by the third party, which I don't have any choice than to follow the law. So they have to make it attractive by paying claims on time. So that people can now have uh, in the insurance industry and go for the premium on compensation. Hello, Lamaza. I partly agree yeah. with you. But the main problem with um, the insurance companies in Ghana is that I don't know whether this part of the world, people don't make a lot of noise when it comes to insurance claims. But when it comes to repudiating claims, you see the, the minute people who have even their claims, their, their claims has been repudiated, making so much noise about it. But I can tell you an authority, but 90% of those who apply for claims are being paid and they don't make noise about it. But about the ten percent, or even less, whose claim has been repeated one way or the other, those are the people who make a lot of noise about uh, insurance being a, a kind of fraud to them. But we have about ninety percent of our clientele base whose claim has been paid, but they don't make noise about it. Yeah, but, but then, uh, then uh, that's what I'm saying that you have to make the insurance industry very attractive. 
you agree with me that the insurance industry is not attractive as we oh, are. Oh, yes, now. I do. We dropped from two, yeah, we, we, we dropped from two percent uh, penetration to one percent penetration. And we are only at 10 percent penetration. I'm saying that if you want to make it attractive, pay the claims, pay the guidelines of National Insurance Committee. But insurance companies don't go with the guidelines because it's just the guidelines. They don't go with it and they keep. They, they frustrate the claimants, they frustrate them through court processes, they frustrate them, they don't know where to go. People don't know that they, are, they can even go to legal aid for legal aid to present them their claims. The insurance companies don't tell the people that look, go and get a lawyer, because a lawyer will be paid by us. So if you get a lawyer, your claim will delay and that says, come, let's give, give you the thing. Insurance <laughs> companies might be up and do it so that they will be paid, so that it can be attractive for people to come in and board and increase the penetration to 10%. If the insurance companies and the regulator don't sit up, I'm telling you, we'll drop from one to zero. Mm. That's a, that's a very passionate observation. I partly agree with you. But, uh, I mean, the, the, the problem has been the fraudulent claims that we, 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 we receive in our offices. When it comes to fraud, believe you me, there are some of the cases that I can tell you that you will not believe it. People <laughs> forge claims and they submit those claims to our offices. After investigation, you realize that, hey, it's, it's a fraudulent claim. Let me just give you a classical example when it comes to life insurance claims. You have a death certificate being signed by a medical doctor that this person is dead. By the time you are done with your investigation, you realize that the very person that is dead is alive. And that medic, uh, that medical uh, doctor has appended his signature to a medical cause of death. Which is very original. But that does also mean that, you realize that uh, the person is still alive. But does it mean that you just accept the documentary and uh, evidence, or you go on the grounds to verify information before any claims? Oh, are we, do, made we, do, we do. We do. We do verification. We do verification. Hmm. Insurance companies are into that. business to pay. Insurance companies oh. are into business to pay valid claims. Oh yes. Oh yes. We are all in business to make profits. But we are in also to, to honor valid claims. Because oh. some of the fraudulent claims are <laughs> it's serious. It's serious. And you know, in, in it in this country, it's very possible for you to acquire any document that you want. So, Mayamasa, can you confirm that someone, in terms of getting a claim, can provide all the required um, documentations for the insurance company to process, but still may not be able to get it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's what I'm saying that sometimes, by the time they even decide to pay the claim, the person might, might die from frustration. Sometimes, by the time they decide to pay the claim, the person actually committed suicide. You see, you see, if you look at insurance, the insurance company don't commit anything than a, a mere promise to pay. The consideration that the insurance company gives in the contract is a promise to pay, no payment. So while the insurance is paying the premium every now and then, the insurance company says, oh, don't worry, when you get accident, I'll pay. When you die, I'll pay. But you find out that when the person is involved or the failure happens, then the insurance company will now try to go into it and delay you unnecessarily. We are saying that if the claims are genuine and everything is paid, if you have any reason why the claims will be right to the assured of the claimant, now look, for this reason, do this and that, they are doing our checks and it will take this time. But the insurance companies will leave you unanswered and you have to now be checking them. That look, my claim is here, what are you doing about this? And I'm putting this and that. And, and that, is, that will make the industry attractive. We are all partners in the industry. We all want the industry to, to be okay for everybody. But the insurance companies, some of them, I won't say all of them, but majority of them are making the industry unattractive. We yeah, are regarding right. treatment to, to, to payment of claims. Well, I must say I agree with you because um, there, are, there are some insurance companies which are insolvent. And uh, I think very soon, the NIC will start uh, cracking their whip. And I believe it will, it will form as a, a cleanup exercise in the industry. And you begin to experience, uh, I mean, some of the good works of uh, insurance companies. Because there are some insurance companies I know when you have a claim, they have to give you a payment schedule. It's all because they are not uh, 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 
uh, uh, they don't have the financial muscles to honor those claims. And all these things are up to give us a bad name. But I believe sure. after the cleanup exercise in the insurance industry, um, we'll be up and doing, and some of these things um, will be a thing of the past. We are paying so. All right, so um, we'll move to the next segment of our discussion. But before then, this episode is sponsored by Enos Travel. Enos Travel is a travel and tour that assists people with visa applications to Europe for educational purpose, for family reunion and stuff. We have the CEO of Enos Travel, Dennis Amwaten, who will just uh, talk to us for a minute before we move to the next segment. All right, well, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy we are discussing this topic today because for me in the traveling industry, I've actually suffered in the hands of some of the insurance companies because I traveled once and then I paid for insurance. It's mandatory when you go to Europe, you pay for insurance. And then first, my flight was canceled. Second, my, my luggage was delayed. And then for three years now, I've not received, I've, I've laid the claims actually, but I've not received the claims yet. Secondly, this year, my flight was canceled when I was leaving Ghana to Europe. And then that was in February. We are in October, going to November. They sent me an email about four months ago. They are going to pay me. I've not been paid yet. So it's, I mean, Lawyer Masai, we have to talk after this. I, I think we have to, uh, we, we have to sue all the insurance companies. <laughs> I'm there, I'm there, I'm not for the consumers. I'm not for the consumers. I'm not for you. Yes, yes. I, I have all the documentations in relation to what I'm saying. So. You don't have problem. You don't have yes. problem. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about it. But... <laughs> yes. Anyway, Enos Travel, as lawyer said, have been in operation for over 10 years. And we've actually used eight years to gather experiences. We offer experiential tours in a way where we actually visit the places and uh, recommend them to our clients. So far, we've been to Europe, America, Canada, Asia, and then some parts of Africa as well. Next month in February, you know, Travels is organizing a tour to Dubai with the best Ghanaian rapper at the moment, the person who's rapped more than 22 times uh, Amrado, who is uh, the creator of the Atensem series on YouTube. We are organizing a trip with Amrado to um, Dubai, and it's going to be a banger, as his rap is also a banger. It's in the process, the flyer is coming out just tomorrow. So once you think about traveling, if you have any visa issues, if you want to travel to any country, if you want to know information about how to apply to visas to any of the countries in the world, you contact Enos Travels on our YouTube page. You, on YouTube, you can just type Enos Travels. On Facebook, it's Enos Travels. On Instagram, it's Eno.travels. And then on Twitter, it's travels.eno. So, Lawyers, thank you very much. And Laya Masa, I'll come to your office. No problem. No problem. I'm around. I'll wait for you. <laughs> and Dennis, thank you for your time. So, you can leave your handles at the chat section. Yeah, so let's move to the next um, the next segment. Do we have any timelines with respect to bringing insurance claim? Is there a timeline, a time back to it that if I don't bring it within a specific time, I can't bring it later? Well, yes. Um, so we call that statute of limitation, which says the maximum time to a client to process a claim. In Ghana, when it comes to bodily injury, you have up to three years to file the claim. And when it comes to uh, property damage, it's six years. Okay, so um, is it six years from the time you became aware or six years from the time it okay? Hello? Hello? Is it six years from the time the incident occurred? Six years to the time, the time you became aware of uh, the uh, damage. Or is when you became aware? Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. No, okay. But if your property is damaged, you become aware. But no, <laughs> let me see, if you look at the National Insurance Commission guidelines, if you look at the National Insurance Commission guidelines, they are saying that you have to put your claim as soon as possible. 
You see, the tendency of you leaving your claim for, for that three years, you no, know, I have three years, tell me which is that the, the effect, the impact will not be the same. The, the, some of the documents who even really discussed it, you cannot get your documents that I would advise everybody that look, put in your claim as soon as it's okay. Gather all your materials that you need, your police reports, your everything, your LA, everything you need, and put in the claim as soon as possible. Because listen, you can go to legal aid, they, they can give you a lawyer to represent you free of charge based on your merits and uh, uh, mistakes. You can also contact a lawyer. I will not say myself, but I become to you other. <laughs> Uh, a lawyer, and you are not going to pay the lawyer, it's the insurance company that will pay the lawyer. So, as far as the law is okay, find yourself a lawyer, find yourself at the legal aid department, because getting claim from the insurance company is, is something else, because they don't want it's to... Technical, it's technical, it's technical, and you need, you need, you need the assistance of a lawyer. Yeah. I know, know that it can sometimes technical. intentionally frustrate you, so you don't come back again. Very very the insurance very very company is trying to negotiate the amount you are entitled to. I see that thing as, as very, very wrong. Because um, I've witnessed a lot of them where they try to speak to the client, oh, see, can you hold, you're not even entitled to me. I just help you, so you take the 2,000 and, no. I don't know why they assume that power to negotiate the, the entitlement of clients. Like I say, like I say there, was this, there was this case, uh, play the boy. Pay the boy. If you Google pay the boy graphic online, it, it, it's an SIC case. Pay the boy. This voice was reduced to nothing. Pay the Supreme Court's own uh, ruling and that reason. Nothing. An insurance company offered to pay the family $50,000. Why? The, the guy was paid more than years because the guy has reduced to nothing. So look at if the guy has not got any lawyer or been bored for the parents to go in and uh, human rights will come in, the family would have accepted 35,000 in our cities. And because that I know, I know there, are, there are indices that, that is used in calculation so that if, say, a lawyer is uh, damaged, we look at the income that the lawyer will be having if the lawyer was working. If yeah. somebody, yeah. say, um, is a water, is selling water and the person gets... Uh, injured we we'll look at the revenue of the person throughout the time and then maybe uh, going forward but the insurance company sometimes make it look like they are doing you a favor by paying you something small to just you, you said it right you said it right you said it right so that is the server you see insurance companies but one way or the other some of them are factoring claims to be cost but claims are not cost Claims are never cost. The cost of insurance companies are their overheads. They are expensive overheads, they are luxurious cars, they are conditioned buildings, and all these things that they spend a lot of money on. It's cost. Yeah. Claims, paying legitimate claims are not cost. So in terms of, now let's move to the next one. Um, beneficiaries of insurance claims. In terms of um, life insurance, I know doing the proposal form, you fill in your beneficiaries. What if that changes? This is to learn, master. What if that changes in your provisions of your will? Which one supersedes? Some people make uh, wills and um, giving out their insurance entitlements to their children. Meanwhile, they've clearly stated who that person is, so that amount is to be given to. So in such instances, what happens? Yes, I, I, mean, I, think, I think I'll give the brief legal aspect, and this can be properly answered by Daniel. The practical, as, yeah, yeah, practical aspect, what they actually do, because we all know the position of the law that if a person dies and make a will, then if the will is valid, the provision of the will cannot be thrown out, except uh, unreasonable provisions and assets. We all know if the person dies without making a will, then the interested person or peer law 111 will pick it. As you rightly said, I've inserted insurance, life insurance, and I've named the, uh, the beneficiary, the defendant, in the form as my next of kin. Those things, in as much as they remain there on my policy documents, on my proposal form as a next of kin, that will override any other thing that you put in your will or your LA. The insurance company needs the LA 
to ensure that, oh, yes, the person is dead. Actually, the person is dead. The court has pronounced the person is dead. And these people are administrators. But when they are going to look at the proposal form, they will not ask who are the less of kings. Well, the less of kings, they are there. But most people make rules and they don't change the less of kings on the insurance proposal form. And that is a problem. Practically, it's a challenge. Legally, it's a lacuna. Yeah, so to add up to what uh, lawyer Master rightly said, we insurance company, we go strictly by the person being named as a beneficiary. We go strictly by that, and we don't go any other way. We don't do any other otherwise, because uh, that was your wish when you are alive. So that is the beneficiary we know, mm. and that is the very person that we are going to pay the benefits to. Okay. Okay. That one, they are, they, are, they are very good on that. That one, I, I, I support them. And no, I'll give no, a sum no, up for, no, for that. Linda, Linda, Amasa Tram is watching us from Kumase. Linda, thank you for joining us. Uh, Henry, Abeku Opon is also watching us from Pistia. Uh, Abeku, thank you for uh, joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Nathaniel is watching us from Bupe. And then we have a um, few people watching us from Europe and then the US as well. So all of you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we've passed our conversation at the time a lot. Of <laughs> uh, we will we'll summarize it with um, going forward. Ms. Amasa, please give us yeah. in summary. What are some of the things that you think people should put in place to avoid insurance companies denying their claims? Well, um, thank you very much. I think, I think the first thing is that we need to be proactive. You see, what we do, and, and it has been a concern for all of us, we wait for the issue to happen, then we are now seeking solutions. Before you get an insurance, my advice is that you get someone who knows the technicalities of it before you even get the insurance. When the proposal form is given to you, take it home, give it to your lawyer, give it to an insurance expert, and let the person explain all the details in there for you. Because that is where the insurance company will look at to say, you didn't disclose this, you answer this question wrongly, and they will deny your claim. Don't wait for the, the accident to happen or your life to be taken off before you start looking for lawyers. Every insurance that you face, make sure you ask someone to look at it. And that is why if you look at other jurisdictions, they have the ombudsman, the insurance ombudsman, which deals with complaints and assist people to just make sure that all their processes that they are expecting insurance is accurate. Because if it's not accurate from the beginning, it cannot be accurate at the end. Because you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stand. My advice is that you get a lawyer, you get someone who knows the system, to look at your proposal for, fill it with you, look at your policy, explain it to you. When you're going for renewal, get them, discuss with them, before you do anything, because insurance is very, very technical. Even some of we, the lawyers, find it very technical. Even insurance yes. employees are happy, they find it very technical. That is funny technical. Even insurance itself, fun itself technical. So it's a technical world that you cannot go there with a layman. Someone, uh, Mr. Mr. Tando, um, also your last words before we draw the curtain down. What are your last words for the people? Yeah, I also encourage everyone to pick up insurance because um, it's a good thing and insurance are into business to pay valid claims. However, if you don't understand any of our technical ways prior to you signing on to the contract, I'll plead that you seek a legal advice or a legal explanation to those ways before you append your signature to any proposal. So as not to get yourself into any trouble in the nearby future. All right, so um, somebody is asking, Henry Abel Kuopon, he has that from Facebook Live. He says, how do the insurance companies track down the next of kings? In case a beneficiary dies and the next of kings isn't aware that the person even made any insurance at all. Okay, so normally what we do, for my company, what we do is that um, there's a time frame to which if uh, premiums are not coming in, we normally call the cell phone of the um the policy holder to know whether the person is still alive or not. If the person is not alive, then we will go ahead to call the beneficiary 
to ask the beneficiary whether he knows so so and so person before mm -hmm. we proceed because you know there's also um uh, confidentiality in insurance which we don't have okay. to disclose anything okay. to know but we we we, we, did, we take the step to make sure that the beneficiary knows that he has something with us and you take necessary steps to uh, claim as well Okay, so uh, Mr. Tando, um, just in case somebody wants to undertake insurance, if you don't mind, we want you to put your number on so that any person who wants to take either life insurance or property insurance can also contact you for business. All right, fantastic. So my number is uh, 0246 Zero two four six three seven three six five three. Yes, just when you were mentioning. And I must say that this session has been very interactive your, your and number. educative for me as well. And we hope that uh, a lot of people right from here. Hello, just, just when you were, just when you were mentioning you your me? number, your line cuts. So please mention the number again. Oh, sorry. Okay. So my number is 0246 37 3653. 0246 37 Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. And Mr. Masa, just in case somebody may also have um a, a lock suit or a lock claim or wants to make a claim against some insurance companies. Um, can you also give out your number so they can contact you for such claims? Thank you very much. Uh, I, want to, I want to join uh, Daniel to thank you very much and all the participants. In fact, uh, we'll do this quite often, but there's a lot of areas you have to touch on insurance. Okay. I'll tell everybody that we have an NGO, which is called Kubik, that's the of uh, banking and insurance consumers. More about consumers. So, if you subscribe as a member, we just represent you in any of the free things. Then you don't have to pay anything. Just subscribe as a member, and we will just do your case for you. And in case you want to join the NGO as a member, subscribe as a member, or you want to uh, personal representation by myself, you can contact me on 054 676 3526. That's 054 676 3526. And I'm also sending a chat. Of, of that number so I can pick it up from there. And I run both a commercial aircraft, so you don't have any problem with that. You are crap, you are, even if you are in Ethiopia, I will come there, we'll do your case for you because of Equus, uh, Brown Kind. <laughs> My name is Kidapa, so we present to everybody with there. No worry. Thank you so much. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tambo. Thank you very much, Mr. Amasa. Mr. Amasa, it's always been a pleasure. It's always been um, an honor to have you on the show and also anytime we get to have some conversations i always say that um wherever i go to i cannot mention anything that has happened to me without mr amasa mr amasa has been very helpful he actually i'm telling the whole world that he actually offered me a place to stay during my <laughs> school times in the law school i mean without paying a couple and his wife mr linda amasa also fed me very well so thank you. This is an opportunity to say thank you for all the assistance that Anytime. you granted to us during the time that we stayed with you and the staff. So um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your insight, Mr. Tango. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that this 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 uh, program also opened up more businesses, especially for Mr. Tango. Yes, Since yes. I know the insurance wants more money. <laughs> I know Mr. Tango is a rich man, so I know that. <laughs> Um, if you. anybody has any question from the audience, um, please, you can ask the question. We have like five minutes to wrap up, so. Hello. All right. Yeah, hello. We are listening. Um, has anybody anything to add? Okay, so uh, if the no suggestions, no additions or uh, comments, we'll call it a day.
And we thank you all for your time. We thank you all for your knowledge and insights and hope to uh, find you one of these days for another exciting topic. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And good thank night you. to everyone. Thank you, good night.